Lisa sits at the kitchen table, tapping her foot. She hears rustling from the bedroom. Where is it? Says Cap. More bumps ensue. Where's what? She asks. He descends the stairs as he wiggles his torso into a black hoodie with a raccoon logo on the front. Lisa glances at him. What do you mean we have to work? This is the underworld. I didn't think there'd be any employment. He sighs. I've got a debt to pay. What about me? She asks. What about you? He echoes. What do I do? I'm not staying here with those things outside. The wraiths murmur from all around, every window. They're harmless, Cap says. I sincerely doubt that. They don't look harmless at all, she says, as one hisses at her. See? They'll only take your soul if you have one, he says. Pardon? She growls. They share a look. He turns to the closet and pulls out a large duffel bag. Zipping it open, he pulls out an ancient pistol. It reminds Lisa of pirates. You'll need this, he says, handing it to her. I thought you said they were harmless. There are other things that aren't in any way harmless. He pulls out a large scimitar with a scabbard and a strap that he puts on his back. We'll be lucky if we get there before dark. What happens then? Darkness, he says, with his face becoming a shade paler. Let's go then. They appear outside, the wraiths still loitering watching them from afar. What do we do about them? Lisa asks. Don't worry about them. The captain reassures her. They scurry away when you get close. It's really if you don't have a seal on the outside of the place that you have to worry about them. They end up sucking out your inner essence while you sleep, so we just have to be careful. They take their first footsteps into the unknown. The ground is spongy and damp. The air is frigid and gnaws into the bone. Just like Captain said, they observe the wraiths dispersing into the surroundings of old overgrown ruins reminiscent of an industrial age town. Ivy and tall grass cover the landscape. Everything seems monotone and gray. Knocking sounds and whispers can be heard from all around. Lisa wonders if it's all in her head. They walk along a well-worn path through the industrial complex, with the husks of buildings hiding shadows. And in the distance, she thought she could hear screams. She listened closely. They sounded familiar. Those dice! She struggles to keep up to his walking pace, feeling suddenly weak. They might exist outside the simulation, but I don't know. I'll have to talk to Dr. O'Leary, he muses. Who is this Dr. O'Leary, and who's the mother being? Lisa asks. One and the same, he replies. That explains nothing. Nobody escapes the deep. He's my employer. We target problem cases. The ones capable of dimensional travel. And he drags his thumb across his neck. Where do they go after this place, she asks. They become one with the darkness, he says in a grim tone. That doesn't sound fun, she says. It's not, he says, stopping for a moment. But I have a chance at getting out of this mess. How so, she asks. The long sleep. She keels over onto the ground. That sounds great, she says slowly. I think I'm hungry. He picks her up and grins. What, she asks. I've got you covered. As they stumble towards the edge of a wall of high grass, they emerge out, finding themselves in an overgrown housing development with several single-story bungalows. They knock on several doors to no avail. 
I could really use a drink, she says, drooling. Over here, you pillock, says a voice from across the street. Standing in the doorway of the most intact home on the block is a round old man. Come on now, it's almost dark. They walk over to the little home as Cap carries Lisa in one arm. We need blood. After what you've done to me, I shouldn't be talking to you after my sister and Jacob were murdered by a... Yes, she's a vampire, says Cap. She's not one of the crazy ones, is she? Asks the old man. You'll have to wait and see, won't you, Benton? Says Cap. Benton mumbles something vile under his breath. We're making a pit stop here, then it's off to O'Leary's. He props Lisa against a wall. We need passage through the void. How many floors down? Asks Benton with one eyebrow raised. We don't have much time, says Cap. Please just one, please say one. Cap shrugs. If you don't make it to your employer, he'll come after me. We'll make it, says Cap. The three of them make their way through the dingy house to the stairwell leading to the basement. As they pass the magical seal, they feel an electrical charge pass through them. In the far corner of the dark room is a latch on the floor. She can't climb down the ladder without blood, or that amulet, says Cap. Fine, but she's not keeping it, says Benton, reaching into his cardigan and plucking out an obsidian pentacle. Cat fastens the string around her neck, and she immediately shakes her head and rights herself. They open the latch and peer down into the hole. There's iron rungs that go down as far as the eye can see. They stand for a moment. Come on, pussies, says Lisa as she quickly descends. Cap follows, then Benton. After a long time of being in the pitch black tunnel, they find footing in the dark. Lisa can see a string attached to a light bulb. The room brightens. They're in a small chamber made of brick walls rounded at the top. At the other end is a short wooden door. Benton knocks at the door, twice. A loud rapping from the other side sounds thrice. The door opens and the room explodes with the sounds of a bustling market, with voices and strange stringed instruments and hand drums, the clinking of coins and the frying of meats. They enter a network of alleyways and corridors filled with cloaked people, gypsies, circus performers. They walk towards the booming of techno music, which seems absurd in this place. Turning a corner down a very narrow lane, they find an empty storefront. Benton opens the door and flicks on the lights. The ceiling is covered in Edison bulbs buzzing. The old man passes Lisa a mason jar of blood. On the house, says Benton. She takes a sip and feels instantly rejuvenated. She slips him the pentacle, amulet, and turns to Cap. What was this business about a void? She asks. We don't have time to chat. Weaving through the labyrinthine market and its cloaked figures, they near the loud techno. In the center of an empty square is a spiral staircase leading down. The base becomes deafening. We have to go down there? What? He tugs on her and they start towards the darkness below. As they get further down, the music becomes so overpowering that it becomes barely noticeable. She, she tries to speak to him, but there's just silence. At the next landing, they reach a large room filled with shadows. Shapes are dancing to a beat that they begin to feel more than they hear. It's deadly silent. The shadows turn to face them. It's a sea of waxing moons. The crowd begins to approach them. Lisa is petrified, but Cap tugs her down the stairwell to the next level. As they round the corner, the space is bright and white, 
marble halls of perfect angles and glass sculptures glow almost. Statues of colorful plastic, living ones, begin to contort and scamper towards them, making alien, unending cries. Cap pulls her deeper. Lisa is so disturbed she blanks out the rest. She keeps going down until she sees a door, and as they exit, they look behind and it's gone. They scan the surroundings. Massive cedar trees mixed with pine and fir reach into the sky. They are on the bank of a bubbling river. In the distance, they hear a phonograph playing a classical violin. This way, says Captain. She stands, catatonic. He looks at her with a pained expression. She can't hear him. Too much inside her own head. He picks her up and throws her over his shoulder and crosses the stream, almost falling into the icy waters three times. A short walk towards the source of the music and they're met with a large clearing and a Victorian mansion nestled between the trees. The sky begins to darken and the fog becomes thicker as they near the front steps. Lisa snaps out of it for a moment. She looks back into the forest behind them. A wall of unimaginable darkness creeps towards them with limbs reaching out, clawing at them. They enter the house. The wallpaper and decor is immaculate and smells of frankincense. They walk into the living room and sit down on the vintage furniture. Looking outside, they're met with an impenetrable darkness. Dr. O'Leary materializes through the walls at the other end of the house, levitating towards them, his eerie presence unsettling to Lisa. He places one finger on his mouth, tossing something at her. She catches it, and it begins to glow a deep red. She raises her other hand, and a similar dice glows above it, deep red. When you get to the real world, you have to promise me that you'll pull my plug, says Cap. She looks at him one more time and nods. You know what to do. She rolls. Perfect six. It's hard to breathe. Darkness penetrates every sense. Tubes rub against the inside of my throat. The cold liquid surrounding me begin to drain as lights flood the containment chamber. The glass walls slide into the floor. Gloved hands pick up my limp body and place me into a wheelchair. They bring me through long white corridors. My vision is blurry. I can hear them talking. They're excited. I find myself in a room with a bed. They tuck me in. One of them said something I will never forget. You're the very first digital being transferred into a human body. You're really alive. The lights shut off and the door closes. The slumber that comes lasts an eternity. It's breakfast time, Stella. She awakes with a headache. Stella? You have to take your medication as well. And you've got a visitor. The Electric Noir.